Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Don Rogestreng. I've been a member of the New Delm Network for many, many years, and I, often I presented research papers. Uh, and uh, this uh, title of my paper today is very ambitious, and it seems like uh, late uh, Saturday evening this uh, might be too much, but I will make it quick because, uh, unfortunately, for family reasons, I have to go back to Sweden, so I have a taxi waiting uh, outside. Uh, but I will make it fast. Oh. First, I must admit that uh, this is not a regular research paper. Uh, I have not uh, done any uh, interesting or, or uh, prosperous research work lately, so I thought I, I should share some thinking with you. And I'm looking at the leadership from a, a little another angle, the selection of leaders and, and uh, what, what, what do we do, what, what engages us, where we get our uh, thinkings from. And I wanted to reflect maybe too. As a senior professor, like I am now, with extensive practical and academic experience, I often get assignments to act as an expert in the recruitment of leaders in higher education. And uh, that is a difficult task, and I can uh, promise that. And lately, I've started to wonder what really influences me in my decision making. I mean, I'm not some decisions are, are done random, you know, and some you can think of a long, long time. But really, what really influences me, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot of time. Well, I don't uh, work only with uh, administrators, uh, educators, but also with uh, more or less confused professors. They, but they are also educational leaders, of course. A uh, crucial question is, who are we as professionals? And uh, this may be an unusual question, but uh, how often do we stop and take a closer look at our professional selves with an uh, open mind and a self-critical stance, leaving our comfort zone? It's more easy to say I'm an expert and I do this and I do that. But uh, if we look critical on ourselves, maybe we find something else, I think. I will make a personal confession. You know already, I am very dedicated to Max Weber. Uh, and uh, as an academic, I always be in that from the first, from the beginning. Many, many years ago, I worked with Gunnar Berg in Uppsala, and he was a Weber fan of really 100%, so he made me interested too. But uh, really, I started to, to read Weber earlier. I read these uh, books like Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft, and I only knew the German language I learned in, in school, so I didn't understand much, really, to be honest. Maybe I, I don't understand it so much now either, but I hope so. I wanted to be as clever as Max, and I even try to look like Max. And maybe, maybe I succeeded, I don't know, you will judge. There are also myths of superiority. If you are a leader, if you are an expert, if you are a professor, you are the king of everything, or the queen of everything for ladies. And according to Weber, people in authority often create myths about their superiority and natural fitness to be in a position of power. But I'm afraid the same goes for experts of my kind. When I sit in a commission for selection of leaders, I feel very strong, I feel very confident, I have a lot of knowledge, I have a lot of power. And th this can be a little... Uh, I think this could be a little bad, maybe. Huh? So the question is to be you or not to be an expert. And when I read Shakespeare, he, 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 it's like he's an educational, a pedagogical researcher rather than a literary person. Uh, to be you or not to be, said Shakespeare, it's nobler in the mind to suffer or take arms against 
So this is very um, important and basic when you work with selection. Will you, will you be noble? Will you suffer? Will you take arms against who? And to know, you, you must know your values. And I've been thinking, what are my values? Yeah. What are my core values and who am I loyal to? Who is my actual client and what responsibility do I have when I work as an expert in selection of educational leaders? I think that all people should use some of the time to, to, to look at questions like this. Um, we very seldom do. Where is my true loyalty? My own professional background, my personal, I, I've been, a, now and then, I've been a leader. I've been a military, for example. And I've been a headmaster. But most of the time, I was a teacher. And also, of course, a researcher. So this is my professional background, divided into these three uh, similar or different views. And when, as you know, educational leaders in school, they often start as teacher and then they get promoted to be a, a, a leader, a headmaster, a principal. But there's problems with this because teachers, they're at the heart of the classroom. They're king in the classroom. And educational leaders, they are at the center of a community or center of the the school center of the organization. And a good leader is not necessarily a good educator. This is a very, very important question. I've listened to, to all the speeches now for, for, for these three days. And when we speak of leaders, we should maybe use some seconds or minutes to, to examine where do they come from. Are they a teacher promoted as a leader, or do they come from the outside? In a complex world, leaders don't always know enough to decide what is new and better. And leadership is a group sport. Edgar Schein say that. But as you know, for example, from not from this uh, horse pole or what it's called, but from football, for example, uh, now the players are not the most important. It's the trainers, it's the leaders. But it's not, it's not absolutely necessary that the good football trainer has been a good player. There's no connection there. It's, it's a field for research. Well, the recruitment of educational leaders should be based on important leadership characteristics like effective decision-making skills and resourcefulness in terms of desired goods, goal, goals, for, excuse me, and objectives of the educational institution. And my job is to choose the right person. Hmm? Re the recruitment process is uh, very uh, strict and uh, it follows special rules when you they send us, uh, uh, the forms and they get interviews and you see it is normal it's, a, it's all over the world it's the same recruiting people but again then how can one choose the right person in this process I think that to be a good selector you must have an ethical compass, an ethical and moral compass that is adaptable to the requirements and expectation of the clients. But of course, another question, as I told you before, who is the client? Huh? Who shall be in the middle? And as you know, you can't have missed it, uh, Weber said that uh, he had certain views on society and its social significance, but he didn't say what's right or wrong. So 
the more I read, the more unsure I get which direction shall I take, who sh shall I uh, choose. Dichotomization is a, is a very crucial thing in this. That means that two things fit together or, or don't fit together. And uh, if you should uh, recruit an educational leader, he should be skillful in this part and that part and another part. And not so skillful maybe in other parts. And how we can do this, mix, how can we mix this together so we get the best of it? I have a sense of dichotomization rather than a holistic overview. I mean, if I, don't, if I don't look at a person in a holistic way, I don't see the person, I only see the skills. Yeah. It's like Katrin said, that we must listen to the children. Children must be in the center, not the organization, not, not, not the environment. Huh? And educational leaders, they're also people, human beings, not only leaders. I made a study, or I'm, I'm working on a study, an autoethnographic study, to clarify what the legacy of Weber may, Weber may actually has meant for my expert role. And I'd like to present just a small piece from an autoethnographic case study based on my personal reflections from previously completed selection processes of educational leaders in higher education. And I bring with me, of course, the, the legacy of Weber, like a ghost. Autoethnography, if you don't know, it's a form of qualitative research in which an author uses self-reflection and writing to explore personal experience and connect this to, to wider cultural, political, and social meanings. It means in, in uh, clarifying uh, to write a letter to myself. I write a letter to myself, writing down my reflections on what I have done, how my decision making was made when selecting educational leaders in true cases. I, t I can give you an example here. There are special criteria for employment as leader. I took this, I had an an appointment for uh, University of Oslo. They wanted me to act in, in the selection process of a new professor. And I got some criteria that I should take care of. You see, it's many, it's small text, and it talks about uh, the, the announcement description and qualifications and assessment and documents and so on. And there also was some general criteria quite many, research and development work, networks and projects, education programs, and this is not the end, this is more. Good digital competence, good ability to communicate and collaborate, personal characteristics that can com contribute positively to the work environment, good oral and written representation in Scandinavian language and English. When I do this work, we often get, we often got, got, got letters from extremely well-educated persons uh, with two doctoral degrees, a uh, number of, of huge research projects, and as I see it, very high competent persons. The problem is that they live in Burma, yeah, South Africa. And I don't know anything about Norwegian school, and then we can just tell them to go. I, I think it's absolutely absurd, I think. Especially in Norway, that is an including country that say welcome to everybody in the whole world. So it's nothing to do with discrimination. It has, um, it's ground in a, what can I say? Uh, it's, it's a system that is a little bit, hmm? should need some changing. More requirements, it's not finished. 
They should teach and guide on bachelor's, master's, and eventual PhD level. Implement their own research, take initiatives, and so on. And this was only half of it, because I had not so much time, so I couldn't show everything to you. But I had a five, six uh, pages of, of uh, <laughs> demands on qualification. And for me, how can I make a fair assessment? Really? Where do I find leaders of this kind? Do they exist? Or is it just the paperwork? How can I make a fair assessment? Well, I have to choose between heart and brain. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I get so frustrated. So I think that I will, not, I, will, I will not do this anymore. Some other can do it, but it's well paid. So I have to, you know, have to buy food and pay my car and so. And then I can turn to Weber for help. And Weber, as you might know, he wrote about three types of leaderships, bureaucratic, charismatic, and traditional. So I can make a first selection on all these assessments. Here I have a group of bureaucratic leaders, here I have a charismatic, there I have a traditional. This is my first selection. And then Weber also was one of the first to recognize that leadership itself was situational. So it's not enough if you have skills in research, skills in this and that, but you have to be able to create a situational leadership. And effect effective leaders needed to more dynamically from one type of leadership to another. Yeah, this is not, this is not anything new. Everybody knows that if you have learn organization theory and leadership and so you know this but it's a matter of getting it into mind yes uh, and to make my mind to see what is this in reality and this example I, I was I was writing this as late as last week and it's autumn and I was taking a walk and I thought that I should tell the any day I will not come because I have no paper, it's no use. Then, you know what I saw? I saw this. It's autumn. And these birds are going back to Africa and in my mind was, it was, it was like a Eureka feeling. Here is a situational leader. This bird is leading this group of other birds, but is also a part of it himself or itself or herself or what we want to call it. He is a part of the group and is leading the group, and that is a situational leadership. And this is exactly what Catherine spoke of, and also Roman, and every other person I've listened to these days. A situational leadership means that you are a part of the group, at the same time you are a leader of the group. If we separate these two, then we will not succeed. I've been working uh, with cultural analysis uh, in different kinds of, um, not, not private companies, but in the public uh, uh, level. Uh, I worked with the police, for example, and, and uh, oh, every police, uh, it was in Gothenburg, in this district, they wrote a letter about how it is to be a police in Gothenburg. And they wrote this and that, but everyone had the same opinion about the, the leaders. They are in that house, and we, the real police, we are in the cars. So that was not the situation of leadership, and the police have big problems. Well, my study, I have reflected on a number of good arguments like this. How I get uh, metaphors to not only stay as metaphors, but to, to understand the metaphor in real life, even if it's among the birds. 
But the legacy of Weber, Weber is very comprehensive. And so are my assignments. That's why I fell asleep on a computer. But I think that together we develop something that I am very proud to call the art of making decisions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dan. I think that's a lovely way to finish off a session, I must say, to bring us all back to the meaning of leadership. Um, can, I, can I ask you a question? Because yeah, it's you... coming uh, 10 okay. posts. So it's... All, all right, okay. Well, then we'll, I'll be quick. Um, uh, you, you, you're almost talking about distributed leadership, but something more. You're talking about uncertainty. You're talking about things are changing and it's difficult to track where they're going. The one model that you didn't, I don't think, mentioned is the idea of having a leader whose major role is to facilitate the leadership of other people. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. This was only one example. I have a, a lot of different examples we'll have in this case study. Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of, of uh, ways to describe leadership. And I, I will, in, in my case study, I describe the different kinds that I, I, I have met and I have uh, implemented in my head. Anybody else, please? Thank you. I noticed that uh, the rain started applauding yeah, it is. when you were having your powerful and beautiful presentation. I would like to ask about Max Weber's bureaucracy. I'm not an expert on Max Weber, but I know that he defined uh, rationally organized administration. Sometimes we also say that optimally uh, functioning administration is bureaucracy. Mm. And I've often wondered what happened to Max Weber's bureaucracy because it, in Finland, for example, it's, it's, it's quite a negative word. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. What happened, really? Well, bureaucracy is, in many ways, today, uh, an, a negative uh, word. And uh, uh, ev mostly everyone say that we are not Sorry. bureaucrats. No, we are not. We are administrators, but we are not bureaucrats. No, we, are, we have open minds, we have this and that, we have a, a flat uh, organization and so on. But I think Weber, the crucial in all Weber's writing, and that was quite a lot, is the, 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 the legality and the legitimacy. Uh, if we find a balance between legality and legitimacy, then we are on the right level. Because, of course, we have to have bureaucracy. I mean, there must be an organized world. If don't, it is anarchy, and we don't want. We can't have anarchy in school. We can't have anarchy anywhere. But this is, this, are, this is a big question, really. And I think it's more about the mentality of today's people. With, with the freedom, I mean, as, as this, we have all the world in our pocket. And this is the first time in history. And that, I think, is, uh, is, is uh, making us believe that we can, we can uh, order everything for ourselves. We don't need anyone to tell us anything to do. But we do need, absolutely. And when I select leaders, of course I select bureaucrats. There can't be any hippies or something. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, as I know, you've got a taxi waiting no, for you. Um, can I thank you very much, Dan, thank for you. that wonderful presentation. Can I thank the other presenters, and particularly Roman at the back, who I will immediately apologize for once I uh, step down from this. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending, and uh, I hope you've had an enjoyable conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.